My name's Amr Spitzer. I'm a lighting artist here at Cloud Imperium Games. Hello, my name's Nath. I'm the vehicle art director here at Foundry 42. I'm uh, Chris Campbell. I'm lead lighting artist at Foundry 42 in Frankfurt. Hi, uh, my name is Maria. I'm the lighting artist for uh, Star Citizen. I'm Ben. I'm a graphics programmer. And by habit, I've sort of become the volumetrics and the lighting kind of guy. Lighting in general, um, my, my opinion of it is, is, is pretty much the most important part that goes into a, a, an environment or a ship or, or, a, or a planet before it goes out the door. Bad lighting can make good assets look terrible or good lighting can make bad assets quite nice actually. You can have uh, substandard assets and, and light it well. We don't make substandard assets so we're, we're pretty lucky with, with, with really good quality to start with. But it is the basis of it's not just the cake, it's the cake and the cherry on top. Lighting is the, the character of the scene. It, it creates this feeling of like either gloominess or, or happiness. You can use lighting and, and color as a way to, uh, to create a, um, a continual storyline uh, from start to finish. So like a story can start warm and happy and then by the end it can feel cold and, and more bluish and stuff like that. And that's all told through lighting. We started um, with essentially CryEngine, which is now Lumbiard, quite a long time ago. Uh, and the game and the engine was very focused to delivering a certain type of scenario. So it was out of the box really good at creating outdoor environments. It had a, a sun time of day system. Interiors, it wasn't so good. Um, it, it, it kind of fell down a lot of areas. You could certainly get good results with it, but it's very kind of cumbersome. Its lighting systems were mainly built for either large, open, like small-ish levels up to about four kilometers. It didn't really account for uh, really dynamic worlds. So over the years, we've tried our best to cater the engine to something that will scale and, and scale from your little basement under the stairs to drawing a whole galaxy, so that's like the ultimate challenge. The, the scale of our lighting is, is really interesting. The sun uh, is a light source all the way down to like a small decorative light on, on a table or something like that. We, we try and keep the, the power of those lights in relative terms, so obviously the sun needs to feel hundreds or thousands of times more powerful than a little desk lamp and that creates interesting questions for like how the camera auto exposure works. So how like it feels when you, when you come from a, a small dark room and walk into like a, a brightly lit exterior, like on the surface of a planet or something, that uh, we need to create that feeling that uh, there's a real difference of intensity between these lighting sources. In Star Citizen, the idea is that you'll be able to go up and literally shoot out every single light in an environment and the environment has to be able to react to that. So, how do you build that using the existing tech? We, we couldn't, so we had to retool a lot of things. You know, there's all of these variables now at play and, and the tech wasn't there, so a lot of the, the improvements that the graphics team has been working on has been to allow those things to exist. We're, we're kind of like halfway there, I'd say. Um, we've, we've approached many different uh, things uh, in, in several different ways. So, for example, last year, I think sometime, you saw the anamorphic screen space flares come in. Again, that's tied to the lighting system. Um, we've got on the horizon real-time cube map generation. The whole sun system that we had um, has gone. Um, there is one sun in the galaxy uh, which will light all of the planets. So there's, there's the guys in Frankfurt obviously who are developing the, the planetary tools and the lighting system for all the planetary tools uh, are in the planetary tools I should say. So it's, it's completely driven by, by the atmosphere of the planet. And for, a, for an artist to get his head around all that uh, at times is, is, is pretty challenging but it's, it's, it's good fun. We do use lighting for uh, for creating a uh, a change in the in the physical like in the player character as well. Not not normally in the the lights themselves, but through things like color grading and and post effects on the camera, uh, which generally falls underneath the the lighting umbrella as well. So changing the the color of the screen, like either desaturating it or or adding more contrast and stuff like that. That's uh, that's part of lighting as well. Like if the player is hurt or injured, then the color grading can react in, in the way that, uh, that it either desaturates or, or uh, make, makes the color more vivid or something like that. When it comes to the ships, then you're talking really about a different set of challenges. All the lighting in the ships is 100% dynamic um, and 100% physically correct. Hence, we have a, a physically based rendering system. You do want to have some sort of feedback loop with the artists um, to, to make sure that the light bulbs are positioned properly to 
you know, just, just make sure that even within a small ship like that, your eye is looking at you know, specific things that you want to call it, right? If there's a turret somewhere, you want to know that the turret's there, it's not hidden away in darkness. Um, so there's definitely call-outs that, that we notice, but it's also you know, a collaborative effort going back and talking to the designers and the artists and making sure that you know, if there's a component that you interact with on a wall, that you know that the component's there. And maybe it's flashing if it's you know, damaged or something, right? The challenge with that is you, you kind of need these tools put in place um, to, to make that happen. Now, what was happening up until a few weeks ago now we, we have a layering system, so um, you'd essentially group lights into small groups and switch them on and off at different times during the ship's state. So if it was in an emergency state, you'd switch the default state on, uh, off, sorry, and then switch the emergency state on. Now, that kind of works in theory, but it has a lot of, a lot of problems with it. First problem is your, your, your cry file or your lumberyard file ends up being obscenely big because we have thousands upon thousands of lights um, that essentially three quarters of them most of the time are switched off. And the transition between one state to the other is, is kind of it's on and then it's off. Um, so you can walk around the world today, you can come into this room, you can switch, switch these office lights on and they'll have a distinct style when they switch on. Um, they might flicker. If they're an LED, they may come up to a, a temperature and cycle through a temperature color. We have temperature charts that we use that's, that's in the engine, so it's completely correct. And that kind of negates things going wrong color-wise. So we, we wanted a system where we could, we could transition from on in a very creative manner to different states. So whether that's evacuation or auxiliary or even to off. We now have a light grouping system so that each room has its own power state. So you can go in, you can enable or disable power to a specific room. You can, that room can take damage and now maybe that has to be put into an emergency state. That controller is creating these transitions for, for me as the artist to control. So when ship A takes damage at location B, like everything within that radius of location start to use, starts to use the system. And when you actually see it working, it's, it's really quite powerful. Um, and it goes to show how powerful lighting is because you can completely change a really ambient, soft feeling environment into something that feels very, very aggressive extremely, extremely quickly, um, just through light alone, not nothing else. I mean, the, the challenge is, is finding that right balance. I mean, if, if things are out of whack, then it can feel like uh, when you when you leave a small interior and the interior is too brightly lit, then all of a sudden the sun feels really underwhelming by comparison, or vice versa. If if it's uh, really bright outside and you walk into a really dimly lit interior, then it's just pitch black and it just doesn't it doesn't feel very uh, immersive or helpful for the player if you can't see where you're going. I think that there's a general vibe that every single level tries to achieve. You know, there's some levels that are vibrant and and you want to be welcome there. You, you or the goal of the art director is to make you feel welcome there. Um, it's a nice, calm place. And then there's the other side of things where it's tense and it's you know something like Grim Hex where stepping in there you kind of kind of you might want to watch your back, right? Um, so there's definitely different moods that the environments want to convey, and lighting plays a huge role in that. It all kind of starts out as a concept. There's some ideas thrown around, and then the design team goes and blocks out the environment and gets an idea for the forms and the shapes. Uh, as well as the gameplay and the path that the players are going to take. And then Art goes in and kind of details it using all of our modular sets that don't necessarily mesh together very well. Then they do decal passes and prop passes to kind of bring it all together, but then lighting is really the thing that, that kind of makes all those elements of the environment cohesive. It blends all of the different assets that we have together and guides the player in the right direction and enhances gameplay, as well as just overall makes the general composition of the level as good as it can be. Lighting also heavily affects or heavily impacts um, visual effects uh, because things like particles aren't aren't normally directly lit in the same way that basic geometry is lit. Uh, they, in our game, they receive lighting from from direct light sources and also from cube maps to to give them a kind of an ambient lighting feel. Uh, but that's that's not always. It doesn't always look directly the same as as the environment might look, and so there's a lot of balancing and back and forth between the visual effects artists that they that they tweak their uh, their particles to the same level that the that the lighting looks, and vice versa. That we also try and keep that in mind so that we don't create a, a situation where nothing can work. So basically, uh, what starts here is like all the uh, interior area is ready. Of course, for now it's purely dark. 
And the, as the room for lighting artists, is once we light on the room, we're gonna tell the space. But how we light up this thing is basically uh, introduced by the atmosphere from our art director. So here is a good example from our art director. So basically, this is the, uh, the lighting setup before, and this is what we are trying to achieve. So <clears throat> according here is like because we have the different version of the light. Basically, we have three different version of the light. Uh, first one is like it's a fake light light source which gonna trigger the uh, emission power. So here is the light feature, and what we do is like we linked it with the uh, emission power to turn them on. So obviously, each space, once they have the feature, the light should come from the direction of the feature. However, uh, in this industry, what we did is like we have this lighting feature first, which is going to control the uh, emission map. And then we have another actual light going to tell the space like where the light comes from, uh, from this spot direction. And after we set up all the space, we were trying to push like different color tone for cold and warm. And once I turned down the fork, I will try to get them even closer with the uh, guidance from the art director. So basically, that is how we work. Uh, usually, once I've done the lighting, I'm gonna just do the uh, character testing because character is a very important part of the game. So usually once I done the lighting setup, I'll just use this test feature to see and walking around and make sure like in different positions, those light gonna cast the character correctly and they're gonna able to see this character. And also uh, we have two different light setup. The one is like the cold light, like you can see casting from the H exit of the door, it's very cold. So in that case, I designed some like warm light to make sure the character always have different code and warm tone to make the image look more interesting. There's new lighting tools created on a probably a weekly basis at this point. Um, we've we've just recently uh, integrated a first pass of our lit fog technology which is basically a way of transferring old fog which is very kind of uh, I mean it has depth but it feels quite flat in the way that it renders the scene. Um, but this new technology allows us to basically gives you a sense of where the light comes from or like uh, light sources can actually cast light into the scene from, uh, from their source. At the moment, the, the old fog doesn't react to lights in any way. So what an artist will have done is they'll have put fog in an area and they'll have sort of set the color and the thickness of it to roughly approximate what it would have looked like if it had had lighting on it. So as an example, if someone's put a, a red light in a room, they'll probably have put some red fog in there to go with. What they're actually trying to get the impression of is some very thin white fog with a really strong red light on it. So now when you put some really thick red fog in the room and then you shine a red light on it, it's going to go completely like opaque and it's going to be incredibly red and it's going to look terrible. What it's actually doing is it's, it's basically just drawing a, a large uh, sort of cuboid onto the screen and then because it knows how far into the scene the opaque objects are in that scene it can sort of it can work out how much fog it would have to it would have to put on here but it has a few problems so as a very simple example you can kind of tell in the shadows it tends to over brighten the shadows it sort of it flattens out the the effect of the entire scene and the other problem we've actually got is if you add more lights you can sort of see that the, the scenery lights up, but the fog itself is just still this sort of like fixed yellow color that I've, that I've picked in advance. Now, another issue that it had, this is a transparent sphere. And so because it doesn't have any depth information, it can't actually apply the fog to this. So the old fog system, um, the, on the CPU side, it just does a, a very simplistic approach to this, and it, it works out what how much fog the very middle of the sphere would have and then just sort of applies it over the entire thing. So if I zoom in on it a bit and then I lift it up, you can see that it sort of stays fogged even as it pokes out and then just as it crosses, the entire thing sort of leaves the fog. So it, that was mostly work roundable, but um, you often have problems with um, windows on ships or anything with a large canopy would suddenly, it would suddenly the, the whole canopy would then suddenly sort of pick up the fog of the inside of the place. So now we've got dynamic fog, dynamic particles to go in with lighting. It's incredibly cool. 
I've got a bit of a reputation for liking the fog and particles a little bit too much. It's actually the, the second thing I do as soon as it goes into a level. You automatically get depth, you get a certain ambient and a mood via, via the fog. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just incredibly powerful. It kind of backs up uh, all, all the hard work the lighting guys put into, into the levels. And that's intense. <laughs> that's very intense. So with the new fog, you can obviously see that the, the lights are actually affecting it. Um, we've got a spotlight here going into it. What's quite nice is that if you get down into the soup, you can kind of, you can actually very clearly see that there are these sort of shafts of darkness where the shadows properly affect the fog. So this is um, this is tech that we're integrating from Lumbiard at the moment. It's sort of it's still in progress at the moment, but um, if I switch over to the debug modes, I can sort of show how it's working. So this is just a, like a horizontal slice that we've taken through the texture that we use. So what we've got here is, um, it's kind of a, it's a volumetric texture that's, at the moment, it's about a fifth of the screen resolution and about 64 slices deep. And so the, the samples are kind of distributed towards the viewer end so that you get more detail up at that end. And just because, because the camera sort of widens, the, your field of view widens in the distance, the same amount, the same uh, number of divisions is sort of spread over many more meters in the distance. But as you can see, this, um, this rectangular volume has been sort of inserted into um, the volumetric texture. It doesn't bother inserting them here because it knows uh, it knows that there's an opaque object, so it doesn't really need to know what values it's got there. So that's just a, an optimization. So that's just the density and the color of the, of the volume that's been inserted there. So then after that, we have a second pass that um, it takes it takes all the lights in the scene. And again, this is just a, a single thread of the of a compute shader is run for every uh, every voxel of, of this volume. So into a second texture, we take all the lights in the scene, um, we multiply them through with the, with the density and with the opacity of the volume. Um, and we actually, you, c you can't really tell here, but it's, it's working out, depending on your viewing angle, it's sort of saying a light will sort of scatter towards the camera more, so I think that you probably can't see it, but the highlights will change shape very slightly, or maybe not. But also from here, you can see that um, this this dark lump here is casting a shadow from the main light, but it's then it's still receiving kind of blue light from the sides. So then the next pass after that, we actually we do a little bit of blurring after this point. But um, the next interesting pass, what this is is it's actually it's a ray march that's been done through the entire volume. So at this point, it's worked out that any object that wants to be wants to have fog applied to it, now just has to, it can just read a single point in the texture and it knows that that's exactly how much fog something at that distance would need. So up near the front, you can sort of start seeing the fog coming in, but as, as you get deeper, anything beyond about this point is gonna get exactly the same fog drawn over it as about this point because it's, it's pretty much opaque by that point. The great thing about that is that whereas the old transparency you had to just work out for a single object on CPU how much fog in general it would get, uh, this you can now just, any pixel that's being drawn can just read this texture, find out how much, how much fog it should have so it doesn't have any of the same problems. Another quite nice thing actually about this, if we go back to, the, to this view, so this is now evaluating a noise function and just applying it onto the fog. So you can sort of see the patchiness just sort of slowly drifting around inside it. And now if I turn off the debug, you can now see that there's a sort of, there's slightly more richness and there's slightly more kind of complexity drifting around, which sort of lets you kind of work into the scene a little bit more, like sort of get more interest, get more variation. In order to switch over, we need to basically pick a date where every old fog volume in the game will break and every new one will start working. And so it's just a case of once, we, once we've got the tech in and we're satisfied that none of the parameters are gonna shift around um, and you know, suddenly the density value won't mean twice as much as it did yesterday or you know, whatever like that. At that point, the environment teams and the ship teams have to go through absolutely everything that's got fog volumes on it and just make sure that they all look good or delete them if they don't or replace them or whatever, check that the lights shining onto it don't show anything that was slightly dodgy about how the lights were set up, or all that kind of thing. It basically replaces the old fog technology completely. It looks better in almost every conceivable way. <laughs> we've been integrating it from the most recent Lumbiard release that we've got. A lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment is just sort of 
moving, taking that and integrating it with the with the things that we've changed in our in our copy of the engine. So minor things like um, exactly where you get shadows from for the sun, we've changed that to be slightly more efficient. But obviously the new code is coming from a system that hasn't done that, and so we just have to go patch that up, find find where those parameters are coming from, find where that data's coming from, make sure that it all feeds through in the right ways, sort of hunt down bugs that are caused by by differences between the two systems. The fog, uh, especially in space, is going to make a huge difference. Um, the UK graphics guys are looking into creating a unified fog system so that even in you know the asteroid belt, right now they're kind of dull and, and plain looking. It's just a bunch of rocks floating around. But in, in space, you have a ton of ice particles. You have a ton of rock particles. You have all these little dust particles floating around, and that creates volume. Um, so really, one of the focuses going forward is making those faces, spaces feel more alive and, and like there's matter there, um, like there's stuff that you're passing through as you're flying through the, the asteroid belt. Uh, and that's, that's driven by the fog system. So that fog system is going to be, be massive. But having that in the engine is, is incredibly cool. Um, you can create a sense of depth just with fog alone. And as soon as you, you introduce lights dynamically reacting to that fog, which is what an artist would spend a long time trying to recreate, it's an incredibly powerful tool to have to be able to guide players like we kind of touched on before. Uh, and to create a sense of depth uh, away from the camera. Sometimes the things that you don't see in the world and your, your, work, your, your mind makes up what that is, is, is far more powerful than actually seeing that asset. So, so strong silhouettes and things like that is, is a very kind of distinct and cool style, in my opinion. The fog was <coughs> on the uh, different four, so if by default the fog going to come like really intense, so it depends on what kind of thing you are working for. I can show this is the default sense, so they just come with a volume, but you're gonna active the fog scattering with the light. So depends on the situation of each scene, we have to design like where the fog is come from or what may possibly cause the fog. And Usually the fog effect shows up on the like brightest point. See, we have a hot spot around the ground and we've got the window, the lighting traveling through here. So uh, in my way, how I design the fog scattering is like alongside the direction of the uh, possible lighting source comes from. See, here's a window, so that's why those fog are gonna fall in that way. So this is the actual lighting source. And again, um, if I turn on this everything in life, so the entire sense, uh, lighting-wise, it consists with basic emissive light feature and the real lighting uh, hotel the space and the fog effect. It's brand new, it's only come in this week, and we're, it, we're at the stages now of scaling it up. So we, we, it's going to work in an environment like this. Uh, great reference, thanks guys. But we've got, uh, we obviously need to make that work on the scale of a nebula, which is, is, is bigger than a, uh, you know, a solar system. <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited about the lit fog. It's something I've played with for, uh, for a few years, and it constantly amazes me with how, how much it improves the atmosphere of, of an area. Um, it just makes things just the air feel thicker and you can really feel like you're you're in this space Like every single day I basically grab a new build and there's always some kind of new thing That's just like a new value that I can tweak that just makes things look a little bit cooler and It's it's really exciting being able to see that kind of stuff Wow <laughs>